Welcome to Talk Back. Today we will be discussing the impact of the World Trade Organization on Indian industry. India's development strategy since independence has focused on industrialization as the principal instrument to attain better standards of living for our people. From 1947 to 1990, our strategy of industrialization relied heavily on the leadership of the public sector and functioned within a closed economy framework in which foreign trade and foreign investment had a limited role to play indian industry has a major role to play in rising to the challenges of the process of globalization of which wto is only a part to discuss these issues with me i have dr shankar acharya the chief economic advisor to the government of india and a highly respected economist dr acharya received his first degree at oxford university and then a phd at harvard university also i have here dr amit mitra secretary general of fiki and an economist turned policy activist who got his first degree at presidency college calcutta my college and his phd at duke university in the united states welcome dr acharya and dr mitra when we talk of uh, wto the first reflex uh, that happens is that of protection and they are asking us to open up uh, basically the perception of an average indian is that in the wto we have agreed to a maximum limit on how much tariffs we can put on our imports this is what we call binding our tariffs and Uh, the feeling is that why should we give up our freedom to let somebody else tell us that we cannot put uh, custom duty above a certain rate um on the other hand economists talk of efficiency arguments why we should go in for uh, this sort of uh, negotiations at the wto what would be your reaction to this fear that we are giving up sovereignty in agreeing to bind our tariffs dr chadar well is a couple of points first of all every country in the wto is giving up something when it comes to an agreement and i think the key point there is that uh, wto being an international trade treaty binds the most powerful trading nations as much as it binds or perhaps it binds them more as it binds the relatively weaker trading nations amongst which we still are Mm-hmm. The second point is when it comes to binding um, tariffs I think you will notice that successive governments during the 1990s in India have followed if you might call a two track policy that is we've reduced customs tariffs unilaterally essentially because we believe that very high tariffs are bad for our economy for many reasons including economic efficiency which you mentioned it also uh, protects uh, industry excessively it hurts agriculture it hurts exports and so forth so we have unilaterally decided to be reducing tariffs in a phased manner what we bind in wto is simply the maximum level as you pointed out and that we bind in the context of negotiations with other countries on many topics including tariffs so there's give and take mm-hmm. um amit um, in fact a number of finance ministers have said that we must bring our tariffs down to asean levels which are much lower than the average that we have today of 30% or so and yet indian industry uh, uh, gets very worried about um, uh, bindings of tariffs would you explain to our viewers uh what we, uh, industry means when it keeps talking about peak tariffs first of all we must understand that before the gap signing agreement our tariff rates were 71% average and today it is 32% that's a phenomenal decline it could even be lower really effective tariff could be even lower secondly what we did is 62% of uh, items that we import we put into the bound rates so we gave a rate as a international agreement 
that we will be bound by this at least and the rest we put into quantitative restrictions mm -hmm. which means you need a license it's not simply tariff you cannot yeah. really import we'll come to that yes yeah. now the peak tariffs what is interesting is to the united states if you send sugar let us say after you have fulfilled a, a tariff quota the peak you won't believe will go up to something like 167% the us's average tariff is only 3% they say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so peak tariff is outside of the tariff quotas for many items that they have set that means this much is okay at the normal tariff if you bring in more mm -hmm. immediately mm -hmm. escalation starts and it goes to a peak mm -hmm. so we were surprised to find in fiki our research showed that the peak tariffs could be as high as 160% Mm -hmm. we need to modify this yeah yes. most other developing countries that we are competing with have tariff rates of 15 yes. that is half the well, average tariff that we yes have. i agree but the issue is china began its reforms in 1985 for the industrial sector mm -hmm. overall reforms in 79 korea began its reforms into market economic process and export and all this in the 70s we began our reform barely 7 to 8 years ago Mm -hmm. So what we ought to be saying is yes we will move in the direction of tariffs that others have but in a calibra calibrated manner which suits the historical process the worry today is that on the one hand we say that on balance of payments grounds we go to the WTO and we say that you allow us mm -hmm. to keep mm -hmm. the quantitative restrictions or import yes. licenses yes. but on the other hand when we want to encourage foreign investment we say yes. we have reserves we have good policies mm -hmm. we are inviting foreign investment yes. uh, shankar don't you think there is a contradiction there i don't think so you should and we no longer take this view mm -hmm. because if you go back in time uh, certainly what you are characterizing as a government position would have been correct say in the early 1990s mm -hmm. but since i think uh, the middle 1990s government of india at that time it was the congress government then it became the united front government successive governments have taken the view that yes uh, import licensing or quantitative restrictions for balance of payments reasons need to be phased out mm -hmm. and we had indeed in 1997 offered to our major tra uh, trading partners a six year phase out mm -hmm. uh, of what remained Uh, by the way i should say that even before that a lot of them had been done away with for our own good reasons mm -hmm. nothing to do with wto mm -hmm. but in 97 we offered the six year phase out uh, most of our major trading partners accepted this the united states wanted a faster phase out they took us to the dispute settlement mechanism of the wto they won the case we appealed they won the appeal net result is that instead of a six year phase out we have essentially a four year phase out which started in April 1997 and ends in April, April 2001. 2001. Right. Now let me say that today would you agree that we are one of four or five countries in the world that has quantitative restrictions on imports all other countries have switched to tariff protection. Well no, this is a, I should clarify mm -hmm. a lot of countries including a lot of developed and industrial mm -hmm. countries maintain Uh, quantity restrictions on in the, the area textiles. of textiles yes, on which we have yeah, a major correct. interest that's true so yes, you have to yes. leave that whole area of Leaving textiles which is a very yes. big uh, yes. aside i'm sorry i'm not ready to leave that out mm -hmm. it is unfair that multifiber agreement requires that quantitative restrictions will continue by the united states and europe till 2004 december which means practically to 2005 but we have to remove every quantity of restrictions why right. why because we signed an agreement this was the Agreed. multilateral Agreed. so what you could say is they got away with something yes. you know where there was a lot of backloading and yes. they put it all off to the last day when they'll remove it to us in fact 49% reduction uh -huh. in the last year the rest yeah. of the time it Correct. looks better again yeah. i think uh -huh. just just so that your viewers i know the facts see the, the this on the textile with the backloading uh -huh. of uh -huh. the removal of restrictions on textiles yes. uh, which mm -hmm. is of course uh, most developing countries are strongly against uh, was part of the uruguay round package yes uh, and we can certainly say that well it wasn't a unfair package and so forth which we have maintained to some extent but mm -hmm. in a sense it was signed the quantity restrictions or import licensing for balance of payment reasons was a matter outside that exactly because the the mm -hmm. these uh, licensing restrictions mm -hmm. were originally allowed in the gat charter for temporary balance of payments difficulties mm -hmm. and that yes. argument lost its force 
Great. after 40 years. Yes. And also as our balance of payments improved after the measures taken in the early 90s. And uh, so really, you know, government has taken the view, yes, we should phase them out in a calibrated way and we were prepared to do so and we are doing so. Yeah. Uh, well, the government has just... taken a view, but I, I, if, I, if you'd allow me to, I think there is a lot of concern in the country today that on the one hand you are saying that by April 1, 2001, you are going to have no import licensing and consumer goods and other goods can come in, of course, at certain duties that will be certain imposed. Import duty, okay, but the fact is, at the same time, you are not really preparing our industry to take on that challenge. Yeah. You still will have items like mango squash, uh, chili chutney and what you, what you have, which will be importable yes. at a certain duty, but yes. a large scale Indian producer yes. would not be able to produce well, that. What would you well, say to that? Well, there is perhaps a very simple uh, process. We are not saying that when we remove the license, mm -hmm. we will not put an import duty. Yes. And the industry is of the view that if you start with a 40% import duty, which mm -hmm. is more or less what our bound rates are, mm -hmm. right. it will be a reasonable protection. You think so? At least to start but with small a... small-scale industry is very worried. I think the, uh, uh, true they're worried. In fact, uh, from uh, Fiki, we are working with small-scale industry to empower them mm -hmm. rather than try to protect them. You offer them better technology, allow them to have better machines, put them in, in an integrated form with the large, like mm -hmm. the Japanese did with their small scale yes. industry, or the yes. Thailand did. Mm -hmm. So our submission is that since we have made this, uh, this commitment to the world, that by, and now we have lost the cases as uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Acharya said, okay, remove your Q, quant all quantity res restrictions, but move on to a tariff rate to start with, which will give you reasonable amount of time to restructure industry. Mm -hmm. Let me give you one example. Uh, may I just yeah. say, I think we have to take a break now. Okay. This is very okay. important and we'll yes. come back to that. Stay with us. We'll be back after the break. Thank you. Busan, people are asking the question of the mind. The mind is to go on the train and the mind is to go on the train. 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 The mind is to डिस्कसिंग In April 2001, I see a situation where, from Harrods, you can import mango chutney or whatever yes. squash, but you, as a large-scale producer in India, would not be able to produce this because this is an item reserved for the small-scale sector. Shankar, three days ago we had this conference where the Prime Minister addressed the small-scale sector. There was a lot of expectation that while they will be given uh, incentives and support to strengthen themselves, that some effort would be made to take some items out of the list of reserved products which only small scale sector can produce but it didn't come and there has been a lot of disappointment what would be your reaction to this well you should uh, mm -hmm. i think there is as you point out a fundamental anomaly in uh, the fact that uh, as you say uh, in these reserved items uh, they can a uh, large scale or a small scale producer abroad mm -hmm. can sell in the indian market whereas a medium and large scale indian unit cannot produce and sell in the Indian market. That is what reservation is about. However, I think you have to put this in the context that this reservation policy has been there for many years and you cannot kind of get rid of it overnight. So it has to be some sort of phased approach to reducing reservation. In the meantime, even in non-reserved products, because quantity restrictions are being phased out over really a decade of which the last year is ahead of us, uh, this pressure of competition will hit well, or, or press on both large scale and small scale. Mm -hmm. And on the grounds that the small scale units are perhaps somewhat weaker, one does need to do something special, which is, I think, the context in which the Prime Minister made his announcements, which include more fiscal relief through the removing, uh, raising the excise uh, 
exemption for small scale units. It includes a special uh, modernization uh, subsidy for small scale units. So I think it has to be set in that context that in time reservation will go, mm -hmm. but first, given that in a year's time, even in non reserved items, there will not be licensing protection. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to do something. But so, Amit, uh, I yeah. thought we went through a long period when yes. all economists <clears throat> were agreed yes. that these fiscal reliefs yes. uh, are the way in which you separate mm -hmm. small scale from large scale. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. need to do that. You actually need to integrate them. Yes. And don't you think we need a different kind of policy to uh, really strengthen our yes. industry to face this competition? You know, I, I think there are three things that are feasible to do. Mm -hmm. And we are hoping that in the next speech of the Prime Minister, he will do it. Mm -hmm. One is those uh, those items in the small scale reserved list, which are not produced at all. at all. And there are many Why such can't items? we simply as a nation say, look, mm -hmm. it is not produced out. Mm -hmm. We hope that the Prime Minister will have a consensus, because after all, this is a democracy, we need consensus. Mm -hmm. Number two, over 600 items are in this list where we have OGL. In other words, you can simply import them, mm -hmm. which are reserved in the small scale. Mm -hmm. Second phase is, if you can import a particular component which happens to be under some kind of reservation here, why can't Indian industry be able to manufacture them? So I think political consensus among our parliamentarians across parties is possible that this is an absurd contradiction of terms, that you prevent the Indian. Mm but you allow the foreigner to bring into our country. So I think uh, the next phase will be where all parties will appear, will work towards this consensus. And third is, there's got to be a way of integrating through fiscal process, small and the large. In Thailand, small is inside a large factory, integrating. In Japan, as you know, yes. they set up a 20-year system to empower the small. Now, today, look at the contradiction. One of the car companies which came in much earlier to India, they put in equity into a small guy, built that up for component supply. You know what's happened now? That small guy is now become large by the reservation standards and going to lose all the benefits. Now, so if you empower the small today, within her six months, eight months, the small is in a quandary because of the very low level of definition of small. So three things. One, kick yeah. those 200 out. Mm -hmm. The 600 on which there is a contradiction which no one will deny, eliminate them from the reservation. And those you bring in, bring those who remain, bring into the integration package with a really innovative process as Thailand and Japan had done. One of the fears that Indian industry has, large and small, is that when you open the doors to imports, there will be the surge of imports and industry may not be able to compete. It is quite interesting that in the last four years, say from 1996-7 onwards, in each of the years, the growth of non-oil imports as a whole has in each year been less than 10%. Mm. Whereas earlier in the decade, it was 25-30%. So I think the, the fear about surge of imports as you reduce uh, quantity restrictions, import licensing, is overdone. At least the figures would suggest that. See, what's been happening, one thing people don't uh, often uh, point out, is during this last decade, while tariffs have been coming down and licensing restrictions have been reduced, the exchange rate has changed. And has, in a sense, you know, what was uh, worth... 19 rupees 10 years ago per dollar is now 45 rupees. So from the point of view of an importer, it just costs him that much more to import. So he is discouraged from importing even if tariffs have come down. Yeah, That brings me to a question that I <coughs> wanted to ask you, Amit, that if industry wants some temporary protection, is it not better to give that through a slow depreciation in the exchange rate that way, what you are doing is that your uh, imports are getting more expensive, so your import substitution producer in the country gets more money, but your exporter also gets more dollars for what he or she exports. Mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, if we go through the protection route, then you are actually discriminating against the yes. exporter. Yes. And in this trade liberalization and finding our feet 
in the global economy, what we really ought to do is to push and strengthen our exporters to find their rightful place. Why is industry not talking about that? Well, industry has in fact been talking and uh, Fiki for one has said repeatedly that allow the rate to follow the market. Mm -hmm. Don't be overtly against market processes because ultimately this is what happened in East Asia. Excessive anti-market activity resulted in a collapse. So industry is certainly sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. But let me confess that this has to be done in multiple instruments. One is exchange rate, which will happen naturally. Second, in developed countries today, there are a large number of internal rules and regulations, trust upon imports, which we don't do. Take, for example, the uh, HACCP regulation on food exports. Now, the minute you export shrimp, they say this is not acceptable. You export leather, they say, oh, this is not acceptable. Now, in the Seattle meetings, the whole labor issue came. Yeah. That you well, don't these, these non-tariff barriers, I agree with yes. you, are very important. But as far as these uh, phytosanitary uh, yes. uh, restrictions yes. are concerned, I hope that we have more of those, not only for our exports, but even for domestic consumption. Which the industry is so, really changing, and we yeah, like that. Yeah. But you know, my point to you is that I hear much mm. more about anti-dumping duties, mm -hmm. which is a discriminatory instrument and less about exchange rate depreciation, well, which is a more neutral the instrument. the biggest anti-dumping anti -dumping action country in the world, which Japanese tell us, yes. is United States. Mm -hmm. Because their anti-dumping laws are yet not wholly consistent with WTO, and they say they will change it. So anti-dumping itself has become an instrument, in addition to where tariffs are not there, as a form of trade market access restriction. So yes. they have the textile quota, so we can't our greatest strength textile. Mm -hmm. Gems and jewelry recently, we reached the quota in the United States. They did not extend our quota, but they did extend Thailand's and Oman's quota last week. So there again we can negotiate. And interestingly, anti-dumping mechanism in India has to be strengthened. It has, I must say, has been strengthened in the last one year significantly. As a definite point, I don't think it is anti-market at all. What you are yes. saying is that somebody else is able to send a product, export a product to us, which is half the price of what an Indian producer can produce, mm. but you say they are unfairly mm -hmm. sending it here, and mm -hmm. you should therefore put duties on these products such yes. that the price becomes as high as what the Indian producer gives. Now, as a consumer, yes. I would say you are discriminating against the most efficient producer, and this is, to me, backdoor protection. No, but Isha, I think we have yeah. to be careful there, because um, it is not uh, under uh, anti-dumping uh, rules. The real issue is not whether the exporter abroad is necessarily the most efficient. The real point, there are two really tests. One is, is he, is he underselling mm -hmm. compared to his own costs? Mm -hmm. uh, you're right, the, our consumer may benefit from that, but then you know you have to bear in mind the interests of our domestic producers to some extent, mm -hmm. I would argue. Secondly, the issue of injury. You have to show material injury. So I think uh, there is amongst most sort of economists, trade specialists, a view that anti-dumping does have some logic, but if uh, trading nations resort to it excessively, whether it's US, whether it's India, whether it's Korea, whoever, then it does undermine the whole spirit of the international trading arrangement. Now take the case of China. We have to prove that the Chinese are dumping and China itself has no published data on their cost structure. That's true. Because of their yeah. whole internal process. So if you didn't have it, today the chemicals industry is in very great stress due to Chinese uh, products, which we suspect, I mean industry suspects, is well below their uh, cost of production because we don't know what their costs are. Mm -hmm. U.S. has 300 officers handling dumping. Yeah, well, we have, sure we have only four. Still, yes, but we also have scarce resources. Uh, but I would like a last comment from each of you on how in the context of trade liberalization and gaining market access, you see India and Indian policies strengthening Indian and industry to cope with this? First well, you. I think uh, since this is about WTO, mm -hmm. we must remind ourselves that one of the great benefits 
of an international agreement like WTO is it controls the protectionist behavior of the largest markets in the world. True. And that is the best hope for market access. There will always be irritants, you know, which are tilted specifically against developing countries or individual countries, and we must certainly fight against them. And provided we have a case, we should take it to the dispute settlement uh, authority. But we also gain from WTO as a message, which is, I think, fundamentally important, because we gain market access. Uh, there are obviously a lot of other things that we need to do domestically. We should have policies which encourage efficiency. Uh, he mentioned about the whole reservation area. That's one clear area. We have to think ahead much more and do something. Uh, there's issue of labor laws, which is a touchy area, but it is one which does dilute the competitiveness of organized Indian industry. And there are many other such areas. Uh, we need to make our industry much more competitive. I mean, there is no question that market access in some areas have really gone up in the new uh, uh, world global trading environment. Take, for example, software. We have no software exports. Today we have, uh, we have become a world leader in some people's minds due to market access. Even in textiles, we are meeting our quota. Gems and jewelry, we are exceeding. We are just meeting our quota. Now, once the multi-fiber agreement goes, if we are efficient, and I mark these words, if we are efficient, we can grow. But if we are not, East Asia will take what we had as a quota protection. So we have done a very major study. So my submission is there's got to be a balance. Mm -hmm. Market access in developing developed countries for us has its own limitations in some areas, textiles, uh, gems and jewelry and others has tremendous opening in other areas, like the knowledge-driven industries of tomorrow. So maybe we should restructure ourselves a little bit to penetrate global markets more effectively in those areas where it's possible. So the message is clearly that we can't sit back. We have to work domestically to improve our competitiveness. Absolutely. We have to become proactive. Yes. And as we gain economic strength, yes. we will be more effective in negotiating in the WTO. So it, WTO is not something that we need to be afraid of, but we must make it serve the purpose for which we are all working, which is development in our own economy. Thank you very much. We'll be back same time, same day next week to discuss more on the WTO. Thank you.